now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Peter Lorre, in his only real starring role on radio in the summer series for Camels, Mystery in the Air. This episode from August 21st, 1947, an adaptation of Guy de Maupassant's The Horla. Mystery in the Air, starring Peter Lorre. Ladies and gentlemen, there are two kinds of stories. Those you can take to bed with you and they relax you and put your mind at ease. And then, then there's the other kind. And our story tonight is the other kind. I still do not know whether it was the shadow of the madness to which the author himself so tragically succumbed, or whether there really was a, an evil something that could not be seen or described, or why don't you decide for yourself, uh, I'm simply going to tell you the facts in a case as set forth by Guy de Maupassant in his immortal story, The Horla. <laughs> Each week at this hour, Peter Lorre brings us the excitement of the great stories of the strange and unusual, of dark and compelling masterpieces culled from the four corners of world literature. Tonight, The Horla by de Maupassant. lovely day it was. I spent all the morning lying in the grass in front of my house, the house in which I was born and grew up. Oh, it's a wonderful house, and I love it. From my windows, I can see our great river, the Seine, which flows along the side of my garden, yes, the great wide Seine, which goes to Rouen and Le Havre, and, and is covered by boats passing to and fro. Yes, down to the left lies Rouen, and a whole city dominated by the spire of the cathedral and, and full of bells which sound through the air on fine days, even as far as my home. Oh, <laughs> what a wonderful morning. I was almost sorry when Marie, she's my housemaid, you know, when, when she interrupted me. Your luncheon is ready, monsieur. Hmm? Oh, <laughs> thank you, Marie, but, you know, it seems a pity to go in a house... Say, do you like it here, Marie? Oh, yes, sir. I like it very much. Yes? I love to watch the boats go by on the Seine. Well, you do, huh? So do I. See that one? That big schooner, and, and it's being pulled by... Look, what a little tug. Oh, look, it's no bigger than oh, a fly. I meant beautiful. Mm. So clean and white and yes, shiny. Oh, white, yes. And she's a three-master, you know? Brazilian, I think. Yes, I... Yes, I can see the flag. It is Brazilian. Oh, she's had a long journey from South America to pass my house. You love this place very much, don't you, monsieur? <laughs> yes, Maria. I love it. I can feel those deep roots which attach a man to the soil on, on which his ancestors were born and died, and, and to the villages, yes, to, to, to the atmosphere itself. <laughs> you don't know what I'm talking about, do you, Marie? No, sir. No. But I do know that if you don't come into the house soon, your luncheon will be cold. All right, all right, Marie, I'll come in. May 12th. 
some reason, I, I've had a slight feverish attack the last few days, and I feel low-spirited and ill. I, I have continually a horrible feeling of, of impending danger, an apprehension of, of some coming misfortune or, or of approaching death. Uh, I've never experienced anything like this before. If it continues, I, I think I'll have to see my doctor. Look, I've told you, your pulse is rapid and your eyes yes, are slightly yeah. dilated. Otherwise, you're in splendid condition. But, Doctor, then then why is it when evening comes on, a, a feeling of oppression seizes me, just, just as if night concealed something horrible? Why is that? Probably just a slight attack of indigestion. Yes, yes, indigestion. Yesterday, when I was walking in a forest of Rumor, why did it suddenly seem to me that I was being followed and, and that someone was walking at my heels close, quite close to me? He was near enough to touch me, and yet, yet when I turned around, I saw nothing. Nothing behind me but the path between the tall trees. Horribly empty. Uh, can you explain that by indigestion, can you, huh? Well, here's a bromide. Mm. If you'll take it in several cold showers daily, I'm sure your fears will vanish. Yes, I'm and sure. And you'll be able to sleep without any further trouble. All right, Doctor. Thank you very much. Who is there? It's I, Marie. Oh, 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 just a moment, just a moment. Yes? Are you all right? What You're is it, You're screaming Marie? and calling out. I'm sorry, I... Wake the I'm servant. I'm up having a nightmare, Marie. Look, oh, if you dreamed that someone was looking at you and touching you and, and taking your neck in his hands and squeezing it, squeezing with all his might in order to strangle you, don't you think you would cry out too, huh? Oh, yes, sir, I'm sure well, I you should. you see, all right. Just tell the other servants I shall try to be more quiet. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Good night. Hey, look. Look, Marie, my... My water carafe. A water carafe, monsieur? Yes, it, it was full. I, I know it was full when I went to bed. Yes, sir, I filled it last night. Yes, and now it's empty. I haven't touched it, and, and it's empty. Yes, sir. Somebody has drunk the, the water. Some, somebody has, has been in his room. Somebody, something drank that water. I don't know who could have, sir, unless perhaps you yourself in your sleep. Yes, yes, I myself in my sleep, of course, that's it. I, I must have done it myself, Marie. Marie, tell him to pack my things. I, I'm going to Paris. I, I'm leaving the first thing in the morning. <laughs> Paris, I, I must have lost my head during the last few weeks. At, at home, my mental state bordered a madness, for, for I had believed... Yes, I, I had believed that, that an invisible being lived beneath my roof. <laughs> how stupid, how perfectly ridiculous it all seems now, yes. Twenty-four hours in Paris have completely restored my equilibrium, and, and tonight I... I'm going to dine at the house of my cousin, Madame Sablé, and, oh, Dr. Parent is going to be there. He's the famous specialist for nervous disorders, and, and I shall ask him, and I'm sure he, he can finally put my mind at rest about this, this silly hallucination. Uh, Dr. Parent, I'm, I've been wanting to ask you, have, have you ever known of a case where a person feels that he has... Um, how shall I put it? And, and not entirely in, in command of his soul? It is curious that you should ask me that. Why is it curious? Because now, only now in 1889, yes. after all these years, we are on the verge of discovering one of the most important secrets of nature. What is that? Ever since man has thought, he has felt himself close to a mystery which has been impenetrable to his gross and imperfect senses. Yes. Whatever are you talking about, Dr. Parent? <laughs> Apparitions, my dear Madame Sablé. Invisible spirits. Yes, invisible. Oh, you doctors. <laughs> You're always being mysterious. Oh, not at all. For more than a century now, men seem to have had a presentiment of something new. Yes. Uh, Mesmer and some others have put us on an unexpected track, and we have arrived at really surprising results. Oh, you're just trying to frighten us. Not at all. If you think so, would you like me to try to send you to sleep, madame? It would be a novel experience. <laughs> If you can do it. <laughs> and if I can, it will answer your cousin's questions. Yes, it certainly will. Now, madame, if you would just sit in this easy chair. So. Uh, 
Now, you must let your mind go completely blank and look fixedly into my eyes. Yes, that's right. Now, you are going to sleep. To sleep. You're going to sleep. 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 You see, her eyes are becoming heavy. Her mouth is twitching. Yes, but sleep. You have nothing but to sleep. I don't like this. It frightens me. Sleep. Sleep. Here, now she is asleep. An easy subject, I must say. Now, if you will stand directly behind her chair, I will proceed with the experiment. Now, Mm. I hand her an ordinary pasteboard visiting card. So. Now, Madame Sable, you hold in your hand a looking glass. Yes. I am holding a looking glass. What do you see in it? I see my cousin standing behind my chair. Doctor, what is he doing? He is twisting his ear. But, Doctor, she cannot see me behind her by, by looking at a piece of cardboard. No, of course she can't. She sees you through her mind. Or someone's mind. This troubles you, doesn't it? Yes, it, it troubles me. But it answers your question. No. No, it does not. That's common knowledge, Doctor. It's an axiom that, that human beings can be dominated by human beings. But, but what if a human being is, is dominated by something? By, by something else, I mean. Something not human. What then, Doctor? August 6th. I'm back at home. Yes, now I know it's useless to struggle. Useless. Somebody possesses my soul and, and dominates it. Somebody orders all my acts, all my thoughts. I'm, I'm nothing except his slave and a terrified spectator of all I do. Yes, but... But who is he, this... This invisible being that... That rules me, this... This unknowable spirit, this... This rover of a supernatural race, he, he must have a name. I, I know he has a... I feel it. I, I can feel it. And, oh, someday, someday it'll come to me. Oh, if, if I only could leave my house and go away and escape and, and never, never return. But, but it's impossible. This, this being I cannot call by name, he... He will not let me. I'm helpless. What can I do? What can I do? In a few moments, Mr. Peter Lorre will bring us the climax of tonight's mystery in the air. Act two of the Horla. August 21st, 1947, Mystery in the Air on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Whether you're taking your pets on the road or a walk around the block, you need to be aware of heat stroke. Hi, I am Dr. Jose Arce, immediate past president of the American Veterinary Medical Association. It's important that pets get out and enjoy the warm weather and fresh air, but here are some reminders to help keep your pets safe in the heat. Tune into the day's forecast to see how hot it will be. Limit exercise on hot days or schedule walks earlier or later on the day when it's cooler. If outside, stay on the grass instead of the hot pavement. Make sure your pet has unlimited fresh water and access to shade. Never leave your pet in a closed vehicle and leave your pet at home in air conditioning when you go out. If you see signs of heat strokes in your pet, such as excessive panting, drooling, unsteadiness, or abnormal gum and tongue color, call your veterinarian or nearest emergency clinic. For more info on summer pet safety, visit avma.org. That's avma.org. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, more of Mystery in the Air, starring Peter Lorre and the Horla, the Guy de Maupassant story from August 21st, 1947. Now 
back to de Maupassant's terrifying story of a man obsessed by the idea that he is dominated by an invisible being. Fear is ruining his life. The suspicion that he is no longer master of his own actions, even of his own soul, is rapidly becoming a certainty. It's only two o'clock, and a whole night is before me. Oh, how, how still it is. And the stars, how bright they are. Who inhabits those faraway regions, and, and what do they know that we do not know? Will not one of them someday appear on our earth to conquer it? We are so weak, so, so defenseless, and what was that? I heard the rustle of paper, yet there is no wind, absolutely no wind. There. It's that book, yes, the, the one on the table under the lamp. It's incredible. The, the page has turned. The, the page lifted itself up and fell down upon the others as if a finger had turned it over. My armchair appears empty, but, but no, it isn't. No, no, he's there. I know he is sitting in my place. He's reading. I can't stand it any longer. I'll, I'll grasp him and... Ah, he ran away. He, he ran away before I could reach him. He, he ran away and, and the window closed after him. <laughs> He's afraid of me. He's afraid of me. <laughs> what, what do you call yourself, you, you evil slave? Whatever it is, whatever it is, someday, someday I'll catch you and, and crush you. Here, come in here. What? What? We heard the noise and we wondered. Another nightmare, monsieur. No, it's not a nightmare. I, I was awake. Tell me. Tell me, Marie. Do you believe in, in invisible things? Invisible? Yes, invisible beings that, that dominate you. Well, uh, I read an article about that an in article? the paper what, today. What did it say? That... Somewhere in Brazil, I think, Brazil. people are frightened, leaving their houses, Brazil. saying they're pursued by invisible beings which feed on their life while they're asleep. Yeah. Like vampires, you know? Marie. Marie, that, that is where he came from. Oh, monsieur. D don't you remember the, the day we saw that little tug pulling that, that big Brazilian schooner up the river? Yes. Remember, she, she looked so white, all white, and, and he, he was on board. Yes, he, he came from there where his race originated, and, and he saw me, and, and he saw my white house, and, and he sprang from the ship. Oh, <laughs> no, no, I understand. And don't you? Don't you? No, monsieur, I don't. No, no, you couldn't. It, it's all right, Marie, go to bed. Uh, there's nothing wrong. Don't worry anymore. Go back to sleep. Go back. Now I know. How, how can I help but knowing it's obvious? Yes, the, the rule of man is over, and, and he has come. He has arrived. But, but what is his name? What do you call yourself? What's that? I, no, I, I know it. He's shouting it out. Yes, yes, I listen. Huh? Oh, uh, that's it, yes. Hola. Yes, the Hola. He, he haunts me. He, he is within me. He, he's becoming my soul. I, I shall kill him. There, monsieur. Why? The iron shutters on the windows and door complete. All right. Well, why anybody wants half-inch iron shutters in their bedroom is more than I can see. Well, at least it'll keep everything out. I don't want to keep things out. I want to keep something in. Hmm? Never mind, never mind. If you're finished, you take your toes and go. My housekeeper will pay you. Yes, monsieur. Good day, monsieur. Good day. Now I'm ready. Yes, tonight he'll come. But 
Tonight I'm ready for him. I, I'm ready for him. Hmm. He's here, yes. I, I feel it. At, at last he's here, but oh, I don't want to alarm him. I, I'll casually close the iron shutter so, so casually as, as if I'm preparing for bed and... Now I'll start to close the iron doors, as if I'm shutting myself in for the night. But, but instead of shutting myself in, I'll... I'll shut myself out! Yes, yes, it's Donnie. He's inside. He, he cannot escape. Downstairs, downstairs, yes. As fast as I can run. Oh, good, good. The lamp is still burning. Oh, yes, fire. Fire, that'll dispose of him. Fire. Oh, see, the house is dry as tender. August 21st, 1947, Mystery in the Air on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. You ever make a change and then think, why didn't I do this years ago? Well, that's how people feel about switching to MediShare for their health care, especially now with inflation the way it is. People are very happy with the savings. Most families save about $500 a month when they switch. It's a huge help when prices are going up so fast in so many other areas. And MediShare's customer satisfaction rate is double that of health insurance. It's just a different experience, and people really like that. MediShare is an alternative to health insurance. It's a community of Christians who share each other's health care bills, and it's been going strong for over 25 years it really is the gold standard, the most trusted name in healthcare sharing. Find out why people love it. Find out why they rave about the customer service and find out how good it feels to save some money right now. They're super easy to talk to. Here's the number, 833-34-BIBLE. That's 833-34-BIBLE, 833-34-BIBLE. Just imagine you were a listener to NBC the week after Abbott and Costello's final show aired. You tune in to expect to hear something funny or light, and you hear Peter Lorre and Mystery in the Air. That had to have been a shock. Uh, this episode, August 21st, 1947, the horror of the conclusion now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Won't take long. See, the, the flames are reaching the ceiling already, huh? And I'd better get out before I burn myself up too. Here, here yes, here, here I can I can watch from here. How slow the, how slow the house is burning. Don't you suppose? No. No, there, yes. A tongue of flame licking out on the top of the window. And another and and another. See it burn. My house, my my beautiful house. Oh, but it's it's more beautiful. It's now in flames because because he's inside and, and he'll burn too, yes, and and I'll be free. Free free of the horror. Fire! 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 The house is on fire! Get some water! Yes, it's burning. Let it burn. Oh, now the whole place is in flames. Nothing, nothing can stop it. That's Marie, the servants in the garret. They'll be killed. Here, stand back, all of you. The roof's going to cave in. Look. Oh, the poor oh, devils, we gotta get some help. Yes. Maybe we can get them out of there. It's hey, lighting up the whole countryside. A monstrous, beautiful fuel fire. And he's burning too. <laughs> My prisoner, that, that new being, that, that new master, the horror. The roof has fallen in. The roof has fallen in. over. That is the end for him. He's dead. Yes, but is he dead? 
No. No. A spirit would never fear premature destruction. Only we fear it. All our human terror springs from that, and... Well, then, after man... What? The horror, yes. After us, who can die any day by any accident, comes he who can die only at his own proper hour, because he has touched the limits of his existence. No, he is not dead. Well, what can I do? What can I do? Oh, there's one thing I can do. I... I can destroy myself. Yes. 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 I must destroy myself. I'm going to destroy. Destroy myself. Destroy. Yes. I... Let me go. Yes. I know I'm being alone. I know. I know it's a story. I know it's by the Maupasson. Yes. I know it's Thursday night. And we are on the air, but... But it's the horror that... Oh, oh I, I beg your pardon. I, I'm sorry I got so excited, but I, I warned you at the beginning. It, it's a very uncomfortable story. Listen again next week at this same time when the makers of Camel Cigarettes present Mr. Peter Lorre in Mystery in the Air. Next week's play will be Beyond Good and Evil by Ben Hecht. The artists supporting Mr. Lorre tonight were Henry Morgan as the voice of mystery, Peggy Weber as Marie, Loreen Tuttle as Madame Sable, Ken Christie as the doctor, Ben Wright as Dr. Parent, Howard Culver and Jack Edwards, Jr. This is Michael Roy in Hollywood wishing you a pleasant good night. And as we mentioned, that Henry Morgan that's referenced there is a different gentleman by the name of Harry Morgan, Colonel Potter on MASH, and in the 1965 Dragnet series as well. All righty, Mystery in the Air, August 21st, 1947, here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Now on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox, we present you an episode of The Adventures of Jungle Jim. This episode originally broadcast August 21st, 1937. Presenting The Adventures of Jungle Jim. Last week, you will remember, Prince Bhutan, with his followers, deserted the camp and headed toward the Chinese border, taking Jungle Jim with him as a prisoner. A short time after the caravan left, Shanghai Lil, Myra Trent, and Ronnie Hawkins arrived at the deserted camp and realized that Jungle Jim had been taken away as a prisoner. While they were discussing their next move, Captain Carstairs arrived over the camp at the head of a squadron of British Army planes. The British planes sighted the fleeing Tiger Claw killers, and Carstairs ordered them bombed. The thrilling adventures of Jungle Jim are pictured each Sunday in the Comic Weekly, the world's greatest pictorial supplement of humor and adventure. The Comic Weekly, each page printed in full color, is distributed everywhere as an integral part of your Hearst Sunday newspaper. And now we continue our story. Lil, Myra, and Ronnie Hawkins are on the bluff watching anxiously with the glasses for some sign of life near the spot where the caravan was last seen. Can you make out anything, Mr. Vreel? No. Here, take the glasses and see what you can make out. The town's natives must have scattered into the jungle. But Jungle Jim and Bhutan were on horses at the head of the column. Oh, I hope nothing's happened. Do you see anything, Ronnie? There are some men climbing the rocks on the left side of the canyon. They look like natives from here. Wait, there's a horse running this way. Yes? Mr. Brill, the saddle's empty. Oh, that may mean the gym is hurt. Not necessarily, Myra. That last bomb was almost a direct hit. The horses would certainly have bolted. Oh, Ronnie, see how those bombing planes are circling? Yes. Both the bombers and scouts are concentrating. One's coming this way. (laughs) 
It's Carstairs. He's probably coming back to land. You two stay here. I'm going up the valley and find out what's happened. Oh, no, Ronnie, wait. Oh, don't leave until we find out whether or not Carstairs is going to land. He may want us to do something. We'll know in a minute. He doesn't seem to be swinging into the wind for a landing. He's circling this way. He's waving. He sees us. He's going to drop us a message. Watch where it lands. Here it comes. Look out. Well, got that one right at our feet, all right. Let me have it, Ronnie. Right up. Here you are. Listen to this. Bhutan's men have scattered. A company of native troops are arriving from south. Remain here and direct Captain Summers, who is in charge, to cover all exits from the valley and search jungle. This note's your authority. And it's signed by Carstairs. But what does it mean? Probably that they sighted the troops approaching. That's exactly it, Mr. Breel. Look, Captain Carstairs' plane is heading back up the valley. I'm going to follow. Oh, Ronnie, you mustn't go. It's dangerous. The men in the plane, if I see you and think you're one of Bouton's men. I agree with Myra, Ronnie. There's nothing you can do there now. Aren't you forgetting that Jim may be injured? I'm going, Mr. Vreel. Jungle Jim Bradley saved my life and my father's. He may need me now. Oh, but you shouldn't go alone. You and Mr. Vreel are needed here to direct the troops, Myra. I'll take this rifle with me. Well, you know what you're doing, Ronnie. Watch yourself. Oh, please be careful. Don't worry, I'll be all right. And if Jim's there, I'll bring him back with me. Meanwhile, in the plane overhead, Captain Carstairs directs his pilot, Lieutenant Rogers, to fly back toward the scene of the bombing. Circle back to the north, Rogers. Deep low, so that I can watch the jungle. Yes, sir. Have you been able to make out anyone yet, sir? Only one or two of Bhutan's natives running. His party is scattered. Switch on the short wave set, Rogers. I want to see if I can reach Holbrook. Right, sir. Go ahead. This is Captain Carstairs calling Lieutenant Holbrook. Captain Carstairs calling Lieutenant Holbrook. Come in, please. This is Lieutenant Holbrook speaking. Can you hear me, Holbrook? I couldn't reach you a few minutes ago. Our receiving set was out of commission, sir. We fouled our trailing antenna. A new one has been lowered. Listen carefully. We have just found out that Jungle Jim Bradley is a prisoner of Prince Bhutan's. He was probably one of the figures on horseback at the head of Bhutan's column. Did you hit them with the third bomb? It was impossible to tell, sir. The bomb landed very near them. The horses bolted for the jungle. Keep your eyes open for any sign of Jungle Jim Bradley or Prince Bhutan. Stand by. Yes, sir. Were they seen, sir? No. Holbrook says that it was impossible to tell whether or not they were struck. I'm going to issue a general order. Attention all planes. Attention all planes. This is Captain Carstairs speaking. Watch the jungle beneath you carefully for a white man. If he is seen, hold your fire and short wave immediately. That is all. May I make a suggestion, Captain? Yes, Roger. The canyon wall on the left side of the valley is steep and rocky. If Prince Bhutan was attempting to keep out of sight, he would probably go into the jungle to the right. That is undoubtedly what he would do. Keep over the jungle and circle low. Yes, sir. It's almost impossible to see through the foliage. Calling Captain Carstairs. Calling Captain Carstairs. Go ahead, Captain. Your transmitting set is on. Right. Come in, Holbrook. This is Carstairs speaking. Two fleeing men have been sighted, sir. They're believed to be Prince Bhutan and Jungle Jim Bradley. Good. What part of the jungle are they in? They are straight west from the position the caravan was in when it broke up, sir. I'll circle over them until you arrive. Excellent, Holbrook. Carry on, Rogers. Holbrook has located our men. He is circling over them. You see his plane? Yes, sir. He's to your right. Keep low. We're coming in close now. Yes. I see them. It's Bradley and Bhutan, all right. Shall I keep circling, sir? Yes. I'm going to drop Bhutan a note. Then we'll find the nearest place to land. Give me something to wait this note with. Here you are, sir. This wrench will do it. Splendid. Now, circle directly over them. That 
does it. One of the men picked it up, sir. Yes, and that man was Prince Bhutan. There's a clearing a short distance ahead. Go there and land. We are going to capture him. This scene has been taking place in the air. Jungle Jim has been facing Prince Bhutan in the jungle below. You will continue straight ahead, Bradley. How do you expect to escape, Bhutan? Your horses have run away and your men have deserted. My men will return. The British authorities will never capture me, Bradley. You and I will escape into the jungle. You're crazy if you think you're going to get away. Listen, do you hear that? No matter which way you turn, you'll be followed. <laughs> You forget that the British have no jurisdiction once we have passed into China. You'll never reach China. Look above you. It's the farmer again, Bhutan. They found you. Uh, perhaps. But by this time, I think they know that you are with me. <laughs> we will not be bombed again, Bradley. He, even now, he's certain. They'll never let you escape. Then you shall die with me. There's two planes there now. Do you still think you can escape? Under the open, you fool. It is scout plane. If you use these machine guns, you will be the one to die. Stand where you are. I've got you covered. Don't get hysterical, Bhutan. It's only a message being dropped from the plane. See? See, here it comes. Uh, so, your friends would bug. Don't attempt anything, Bradley. I'll get the message. Why don't you read it to me, Bhutan? Silence, Bradley. Go ahead, Bhutan. Read it. What does it say? One more word out of you and I'll kill you now. You don't need to read it. I know what it says. I told you you were through, Bhutan. Silence. You are going to die, Bradley. You fool. Carstairs has enough on you already, perhaps. But he will never be able to prove that I killed you. I will tell him that it was a bullet from one of his own men. Carstairs wouldn't believe you on the rope. So, I am to be captured. <laughs> You've ruined me, Bradley. But before they take me, I'll have my revenge. Stand where you are. Oh, cut out the dramatics, Bhutan. Go ahead and shoot. The army planes are watching you from above. And the British don't waste time on murder. <laughs> you are going to die, Bradley. What's that gun, Bhutan? Uh, so, it is you, Tiger. Watch out, Ronnie! <laughs> Hold your fire, Ronnie. You've got him. Help me, Bradley! Uh, are you all right, Jim? Yes. Here, untie my hands, Ronnie. Let's see if we can do anything for him. Wait a second. I'll cut the rope. All right, fine. That's it. Careful, now. Huh? All right. Yeah, that does it. Now, now let's see how badly Bhutan's hit. Oh. There's one bullet here in his chest. <laughs> Hold him while I tear his shirt off. It's no use, Jim. Look. Mm. You got him three times, Ronnie. Bradley, listen to me. You've got to help me, Bradley. He doesn't realize. You've got to help me escape. Is it fortune in it? I'll give, I'll give you. I'll give you. You'll never live, Jim. Wait, Ronnie. Uh, I want to hear what he says. Go ahead, Bhutan. To carry me into the jungle, Bradley. I'll be all right. If you help me get away, I'll be all... Uh... Shall we carry him back to the camp? No, it's too late, I'm afraid, Ronnie. Just a minute. His lips are moving. We've got to find out where those emeralds are hidden. Uh, I'll give you the... The emeralds, Bradley. Where are they, Bhutan? Bradley, Bradley. The British planes. The planes. They are coming. I've got to get into the jungle. I'll pay you, Bradley. Oh. Uh, half a million dollars worth of emeralds. They're all for you. Bhutan. Oh, for you. Bhutan, listen. Help me. Listen, Bhutan. Where are they hidden? I'll tell you. Carry me into the jungle and I'll tell you. They... I... Uh, they are where you were, right in the cave, under... Under what? Oh. It's no use, Jim. He's gone. Bradley! Bradley! Where are you? Mm, that's Carstairs. He's coming. Hello, Carstairs. This way, to your right. I see them, Jim. Here we are. Uh, where's Bhutan? Is he here? There he is, Dr. Carstairs. You'd better have a look at him. 
Hmm. He's unconscious. Who's this man? Dr. Carstairs? This is Ronnie Hawkins, the son of Peter Hawkins. I owe my life to his marksmanship. It was good work, Hawkins. By the way, where's your father? He's safe, Dr. Carstairs. He was slightly injured. We left him behind in a cave near Bhutan's camp. Good. The rest of your party are back on the bluff. Everyone's accounted for. But what about Bhutan here? Isn't there anything that can be done for him? Mm. Best to leave him quiet. My men will be here in a minute and take care of him. There's little left to do now except to round up the scattered members of his gang. And that's not going to be so easy, Doctor. Why? What do you mean? There's a half million dollars worth of emeralds buried here somewhere, and those men know it. Will Prince Bhutan die? Is this the end of the Tiger Claw Smuggling Society? And what of the emeralds? Will Jungle Jim be able to find them? The adventures you have just heard dramatized will appear in full-color action pictures in next Sunday's Comic Weekly. The big Comic Weekly distributed with your Hearst Sunday newspaper everywhere. In the world's greatest pictorial supplement of humor and adventure, you will find all the famous characters who live in the world of color pictures. There's Skippy, the Katzenjammer Kids, Jigs and Maggie, the page entitled Gags and Gals, Barney Google, Toots and Casper, the Little King, and Flash Gordon. See all these famous characters in your copy of next Sunday's Comic Weekly. And don't forget our date next week. Same time, same station for a continuation of the adventures of Jungle Jim. August 21st, 1937, The Adventures of Jungle Jim here on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. We thank you for making us a part of your day. Thank this station, support their advertisers. It's their kindness and courtesy that allows us to be with you each and every time we roll around here on your favorite station. Now, if you miss a day, you don't have to miss a single episode of Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. You can find them at our webpage, classicradio.stream. You can stream the shows on demand there. There's a list of podcast apps where you can download the shows. You can uh, learn more about building a classic radio collection of your own. You can find our social media links. You can contact me directly, or you can buy me a coffee. That'll help us build more great classic radio theater programs. Thanks for tuning in. Tell all your friends the great radio shows are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.